Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me all the way in the back as well? Yes? Good. Um, on behalf of the Bali, a very warm welcome uh, here tonight. My name is Rick Seveke. I am a program editor here at the Bali. And I just wanted to say um, a few words before I hand over the stage to the uh, moderator of tonight. Uh, two things, actually. Um, first is we're very grateful for Maven Publishing uh, for making tonight possible, um, for having Mr. Bartlett here uh, to talk about his new book. And uh, actually, also, our moderator of the evening was the one who actually first... That's okay. There's a seat over there, maybe. Um, our moderator of tonight was the one who uh, actually tipped Maven Publishing on the book. Um, so uh, we have tonight to thank for her as well. Um, that's the first thing I want to say. The second thing is uh, we're actually specifically glad that uh, Mr. Bartlett is here to talk about his book because I think his book explores um, some subjects that we uh, want to delve into deeper in 2016 here at the Bali. Um, in uh, January, we're going to launch a uh, project which is called Power to People, which will explore um, how we can uh, protect civil liberties in a digital world, and specifically not only what the, responsible, or the responsibilities are of the government um, for this, but also what you can do as a citizen yourself to actively or proactively uh, protect your civil rights in an increasingly digital world. Hello, come further. So, for everyone in the room who is interested in that, make sure to keep an eye on our website. Um, we'll be going online this week. Uh, in January, there will be uh, three gatherings around this subject. Um, on, under the header of Power to People, so make sure to check that out. Um, I wish you a very interesting and pleasant evening. Uh, without further ado, um, can I have a warm welcome for our moderator of the evening, Mrs. Uh, uh, Shashia Murali. Thank you. Thank you very much, and this is Mr. Jamie Bartlett. Yeah. Sit down. Um, okay, before we start doing the intellectual stuff, let's do something really, really fun. Because uh, I, I don't know who of you saw um, the Edmund, Sir Edmund of Foxconn this weekend. Yes. Did you also see that there was a puzzle? <laughs> who read the puzzle? There was a puzzle. Show, show the puzzle, Jamie, please. So there was a hidden address. And one person was smart enough to discover that <laughs> and to go to the address. And what was written there is the dark net, so supposedly it was something really sleazy, but let's give him a big <laughs> hand. Rijk van Wijk. Rijk. Wow. You're the only one who discovered the secret message. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> who are you? What do you do? What do you do in life? Oh, well, I'm a student at uh, Technical University Delft, and well, yeah, <laughs> I just discovered it by a more or less accident. My parents ha had the paper lying on the table, and I was like, "Hey, seems interesting." So, well, and you immediately recognize the dot onion address? Uh, of course. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, what was the dark message hidden? in the folks can't no, the, the dark message <laughs> hidden was uh, simply uh, some javascript i'm not sure everybody here understands what i'm talking about <laughs> so i'm just going to make this simple it was simple code and if you execute that code you got a nice message saying you're a winner respect okay <laughs> that's a that's a bit of an anti-climax <laughs> um but anyway we do want to give you a signed copy by Jamie Bartlett yep. himself. <laughs> well done. Well done. Well done. Congratulations. By the end of the evening, you will all be capable of doing this. 
because not only you what does it say oh let's oh we're not curious but we still like to know you're not curious all right Rek. congratulations on being the only one and only one smart enough to figure out figure this out <laughs> Enjoy the book. That makes us all feel rather small, but we're happy for you. Good work. So, thank you very much. Oh, I enjoyed it too. <laughs> My pleasure. And at the end of the evening, you will all be able to solve puzzles like that because we're also going to work with Stan Hecht. Would you mind just standing up for us, please? And Stan is one of the good hackers. Way? <laughs> well, but good in a moral way, because okay. you're called an ethical hacker. So it's like a, a yeah, naughty but still good. <laughs> you could put it that way. Yeah. So you're going to introduce us later on. I will. To the to the dark side of the internet. Wow. Okay. We're not going to be bored tonight. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Jamie, um, who are you? Well. Um, so my name is uh, Jamie Bartlett. I'm, uh, very glad to be here. Thanks everyone from Maven and Dabali for putting this on, and to you of course. Uh, I work for a think tank called Demos. It's a UK-based think tank, and we do lots of research on different aspects of public policy research. And I've actually been here about three years ago to do a, a, a talk on how uh, right-wing groups use social media. And I do a lot of work on the internet, digital trends, I write for The Telegraph in the UK on technology, and then this is the recent book that I wrote. Okay. Um, b before we start talking about the dark net, maybe we should define what you mean by the dark net. Well, there are two different aspects, I suppose, of the dark net. It's a useful place just to start, because the title of the book, The Dark Net, we actually came up with this title about two and a half years ago, when no one really used this phrase. Now, the darknet technically now is shorthand for something called Tor Hidden Services, a sort of ne hidden network of between five and 30,000 sites that you access with an anonymous web browser and that are very difficult That's to censor. That's rather vague, you know, between five and 30,000. It's incredibly difficult to navigate, and it's incredibly difficult to work out what's actually on there, hence the, the very wide margin. But my book, it, that's an aspect of it. That's one bit of my book, is about that Tor Hidden Service Network. The rest, actually, is about the internet that most of you use all the time. It's, it's more about the dark side of internet behavior. The things that people do when they are hidden behind a screen. The it's when we all have a, a glass of beer and we say to each other, where will it all go? That's what, that is you the get answer. onto the internet and stuff. You try yeah. to, to answer. I, tried, so I suppose I tried to explore the limits that people will go when under the conditions of anonymity online and try to meet the people that are part of those subcultures that form online, which I felt were really misunderstood, talked about a great deal. You know, I'm going to sit down because you started, you started your lecture. <laughs> this is getting too interesting. I'm gone. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, listen, thank you all very much indeed for having me. I think I've got a clicker. I have got a clicker. Yeah, thanks. It's really good to be here. And I'm going to, you've already heard what that definition is. But I want to give you one story. I've only got about 20 minutes here to talk to you about a particular story. I, don't want to take, I didn't want to take that amazing screen off, but it's gone now, unfortunately. Um, one particular story from the book to illustrate really the important theme, which is the following. Things online, things in these darker corners of the internet, aren't how you expect them to be and they present moral challenges and moral dilemmas that you aren't expecting either. And that was the sort of lesson that I took from the nine months or so I spent investigating as best as I possibly could, just about staying within the law, these hidden parts of the net. And I'm going to start with this one story of the Silk Road. Now, let's see if this comes up. Yes, it will. Yes, okay. Now, 
I normally ask this question at the beginning, and it's whether anybody has ever, firstly, heard of the Silk Road website. Raise your hands if you have. Okay, right, yes. Yeah, so, okay, keep them up, keep them up. So, now, has anyone bought anything from the Silk Road? No. Oh, yeah, we do have someone who did, yes. <laughs> okay, so I'll explain briefly what it is. I guess less interesting for this audience is that I managed to buy some marijuana from the Silk Road website, which was, you know, really brave of me to do, and I suppose is not going to impress you guys quite as much. Uh, but I want to tell the story of how this actually works. Now, as I mentioned before, there is this hidden network of sites. Back in the mid-2000s, the US Naval Intelligence Department invented an ingenious piece of software which they called the Onion Router, Tor, shortened to Tor, and it was a way of allowing people to browse the internet, the normal internet, without giving away their IP address, their location. This is incredibly important if you are working for US Naval Intelligence. And they did it by allowing you to, if I've got that slide up, no I don't, but this is the slide of the browser itself, anyone can download it. But it did it by allowing you to route your request to go on a website via several different computers which would decrypt your, encrypt and decrypt your uh, request. Very, very, I'm not going to go into the technical details of this, but it was very, very clever. They had a bit of a problem because they were the only people in the world that were using this thing, and it's a non-standard protocol, which means that everyone knows that it's them if they're the only ones using it. So it's kind of a little bit pointless. So they open-sourced it and made it available to everybody. And it became a, a charitable foundation that was run by something called the Tor Foundation. And they developed it, turned it into a browser that anybody can use. And there are now something like three million daily users of this browser. And it was much used by civil liberties groups, privacy activists, anti-censorship activists, perhaps most memorably during the Arab Spring. Uh, incredibly valuable tool, incredibly valuable. Now, sometime after that, some people realized that you could use the same sort of system to also set up websites on this network that were incredibly difficult to censor. Because if you want to censor, if you want to remove a website, you need to know where it's located, on what server it's held. And if you don't know where that is, it can be quite difficult to do. And over time, people realized you could use this network for that. And this network of sites became known as the Darknet. But as I said, more technically, Tor Hidden Services. And every time you hear the word Darknet, that's really what we are referring to. Now, this, as you can imagine, became something of a sort of Wild West online, because it's a, a, a world of anonymous web browsers, people going onto this network with this browser and visiting sites that are very difficult to censor or remove. And so you have a kind of remarkable array of uses, both good and ill, and a couple of them. The New Yorker has a, has a website on there, Strongbox, it's called. It's for whistleblowers, and whistleblowing activity is very, very uh, popular on this network. The entire WikiLeaks cache is held on a darknet Tor hidden service. You have all sorts of kind of activist stuff, political activists. This is the Tor library, which is essentially downloading free books. You'll be pl I'm, you're going to kill me for telling people this, but you can download the darknet on the... <laughs> <laughs> Um, and most infamously of all, uh, the, are, the, are the bad uses to which this is put. And bear in mind the people that build the network, they're sort of neutral, they're, they're, they're building it because they care about freedom and privacy, but people, of course, use it for bad things, as people tend to do, as well as good things. And the most infamous of all was the Silk Road site. You're going to hear a bit more about hacking services maybe later. So I'm going to talk about the Silk Road. So this is what the Silk Road website, which was shut down, you may recall, about 18 months ago or so, but there are still at least 20 sites that work 
along almost identical principles to this one. And this was the biggest one of all. And over a two, two and a half year period, there was over a billion dollars of sales that went through this site. Um, over 100,000 people were buying uh, uh, products from here. Now, the Silk Road was an anonymous marketplace. It wasn't a drugs marketplace. Anything really, with a few exceptions, could be bought and sold. And actually, in April of 2000, well, Silk Road 2, this is Silk Road 1, but it was then replaced. On Silk Road 2, I managed to get loads of customer data. And in Silk Road 2, during the month of April 2013, the most popular single item on the site was fake Tesco vouchers that cost... <laughs> 20 pound Tesco vouchers that you could buy for eight pounds. And hundreds of people were buying these things. So lots of different products could be bought and sold. Most people came here for the drugs. And, um, and as you can see, uh, it looks rather familiar as a site, doesn't it? As a layout, as a structure. You can recognize this because it looks really similar to this, which is Amazon. Uh, is it Amazon or eBay? Oh, it's eBay. eBay. All the same kind of uh, attributes that you'd expect in, uh, in a commercial, in any kind of commercial e-commerce site. Now, the Silk Road, um, as you can see on the left-hand side over here, was selling thousands of different products split into different categories with high resolution photographs, prices, uh, an amazing button. Can you see that up there? It says report this item on that site. <laughs> if you did not think that your product was being accurately portrayed or that the vendor was being misleading in any way, you could report it to an administrator who would investigate that vendor. <laughs> now, just to give you the quick summary of how it actually works, you browse through the site, you place your order, and you've got here with your Tor browser, remember, so you're sort of quite safe and secure on here. You browse through the site, you choose your option, after having looked through the different options, you pay with the cryptocurrency Bitcoin, which is a sort of digital cash that again offers you a high degree of anonymity, it's not perfectly anonymous for reasons we might discuss, you place your order and your product arrives in the post, mailed to your front door. And amazingly, these products nearly always turn up at your front door as described. Why? This is an illegal marketplace selling illegal products, and there isn't really anyone you can go to if your product doesn't turn up. And yet it does. And the reason it turns up is because of this. Because everybody who uses this site, after they receive their product, they go back online, just like Amazon or eBay, and they give a score out of five, and they give a review for the product. And this is the secret of the Silk Road. Customer reviews. A reputation management system in an anonymous marketplace. And so this did, this was the secret, and this did exactly what the economists would predict. Because when you go onto the Silk Road, you have an unbelievable amount of choice from vendors who are being ranked by every other user of the site. And so you can kind of guess what happens. The product quality starts going up, the cost starts going down, as vendors compete for fight for your loyalty and your five-star reviews, because this is the only thing they have to get you to go back again. And so as a result, you have these vendors that offer all sorts of special offers. They will give you your money back if you're not satisfied with the product that you've received. In my story, I was doing the same thing. I was browsing through the different offers, trying to work out what to buy. And I found one vendor, I thought, looks really good, detailed terms and conditions, free package and delivery on your first order, which was good. So I emailed this vendor and said, hello there, 
I'm new to this site. I only want to start off with a small purchase, just one gram of marijuana. Could you please advise? And a couple of hours later, I get a reply: "Dear sir, thank you very much for your inquiry. Yes, of course, it's wise to start small, and I would start small too if I were you. May I recommend such and such? Do get back to me with any questions. Best wishes, Drugs Heaven. That was his name, Drugs Heaven. <laughs> Best wishes, Drugs Heaven. And that's the trick: the introduction of competition and choice." And it did what everyone would expect, and so I managed to get hold of 120,000 pieces of feedback. This stuff that had been left on one of these Silk Road, it was the Silk Road 2, so the Silk Road 2, over a three-month period, and 95% of the scores were five out of five, satisfied customers, satisfied indeed. And this is the real thing. This is the sort of moral dilemma that this creates. Because, on the one hand, all of this stuff, the unbelievable array of products that are now available to people, boutique drugs of all types, the ease with which you can get it and have it posted to your door, it makes more drugs more readily available, more easily to more people. And I think everything that we know about. The study of drugs suggests that that will mean more people are going to take drugs. It's as simple as that, and I think that's a bad thing. And I think it makes it far easier for younger people to get hold of more drugs than ever before. But on the other hand, if you are going to buy drugs, if you do it this way, while not perfect, you have something of a system. To make sure that the product you think you're getting is the product you, you get, and that is incredibly important. And it's incredibly important because, of course, people die unnecessarily from either overdosing, or from not knowing the purity of their product, or from having their products cut with mixing substances. And so here you have a way by which your product quality is not only better. But is actually far more reliably better. And then imagine all the social costs that come from the offline drugs trade, all the street corner wars, the turf wars over who gets to control supply chains. Well, on the street level, this actually removes an awful lot of that. At the top end of the chain, out where the drugs are produced, if demand goes up, this just continues to make it worse. And that's the moral dilemma. That's the difficulty with this site, and that, in, in a sense, to me, encapsulated the difficulty with the bigger question of online anonymity and encryption online and what we do there. It sort of extends your power, extends your ability to do good things and bad things, and creates, as I said, new types of moral dilemmas, ones that I wasn't expecting. But here's the other bit of it. These marketplaces, because they operate in the fringes, are always getting smarter. They're always coming up with new ways of getting around problems, and because they're so competitive, they're always like unbelievably and surprisingly innovative. So I mentioned before Bitcoin. I mean, has anyone here got Bitcoin or, or uses Bitcoin? Or so a few, a few people. Few people, similar hands to the people that said they'd seen the Silk Road. So, <laughs>、um, so Bitcoin is the way that you pay. It's、uh, it's a way of it's essentially sort of lines of code, a lot of lines of numbers which represent a monetary value. They don't re represent anything. They only represent what you can exchange them for. But you can use Bitcoin. You can exchange it for real world money, and you can instantly send a payment from one person to another. Amazingly good innovation, very secure, not quite anonymous because every single Bitcoin transaction is recorded on a public database that everybody can see. So everybody knows if I send you a Bitcoin, that person X has sent person Y a Bitcoin, and they know the value of that exchange. They don't know who me or you are, but they know that transaction has taken place. Now that kind of could be a problem because if you're very clever, you might be able to do different types of traffic analysis and try and work out who's behind what transaction. 
So people in this community online have come up with sort of clever ways of trying to further obscure transaction history. So rather than me sending a Bitcoin directly to you or directly to my Silk Road account, I can send it to a fog, a Bitcoin tumbling place that mixes up all the different Bitcoins together. So hundreds of people, all of us in this room, we all have one Bitcoin. We all send it to this place. It jumbles the Bitcoins up and then sends them on to their final destination. So I've still sent one Bitcoin from me to my Silk Road account. But it's gone through this system, and it actually might be the Bitcoin that started over there, that's ended up in my wallet, it ended up in my Silk Road account. So it's sort of like a micro-laundering system. Very, very clever. On the dark net markets, they have come up with Grams, which is a search engine that just looks at the dark net markets, what products are trending, what products are popular, People have even started trying to sell advertising space here. I don't know how that's going to work. <laughs> this. One vendor on the darknet markets claims to be selling organic fair trade cocaine. Because <laughs> they obviously have seen there's a market for that. That they say is, this is, I mean, this is how, this is exactly the reason these markets don't work how you expect. But they've said... We don't get our cocaine from Colombian drugs lords. We get it from local Guatemalan farmers. And we are going to reinvest 20% of any profits we make into local education programs in Guatemala. Is there any way of checking that? No, but <laughs> that's what they say. And they have a mystery shopper that goes around these sites testing products and leaving very detailed reviews and a sort of highly regarded mystery shopper that vendors will send free samples to just to get the review. Same as Amazon, exactly the same as what happens on Amazon. So incredibly innovative, incredibly sophisticated. And that's really part of the message here because this encapsulates that broader question. What do we do online with when we're anonymous, when we're, what, and what are the challenges that that creates and what are the opportunities that that creates, because this is just a, a small part of a much bigger story. And the bigger story is how concerned we, the public, are becoming about internet privacy. How worried we are about big companies capturing all of our data and doing God knows what with it. An issue that five years ago none of us really had our eyes on but that now has become a major political preoccupation, and for good reason. Concerns about what the government's doing, monitoring our traffic. And over the last two to three years, especially since the Edward Snowden revelations, but before that even, there has been huge amounts of activity and innovation in making more things like the darknet exist. Anonymous web browser use has gone up. And as more and more people, as I think they will, go to places like the dark net, it will become a more and more interesting place for other people to go. And so it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And Facebook has relatively recently opened a site as a dark net Tor hidden service. And then there's a whole range of encrypted messaging systems. I mean, probably many of you are using it all the time now, encrypted messaging apps default encrypted messaging apps. They look and feel like a normal messaging app, but they're just far more secure. So why wouldn't you use one? Obviously you would. There's incredible stuff going on with the Bitcoin technology being used for other purposes. Some people call this a sort of distributed network computing system. They've been around for a long time, but you know, increasingly people are working on ways essentially to make censorship almost impossible to achieve because you can create software where thousands of people around the world have identical copies of stuff on their own computers. And you can't really censor that unless you try to censor or control every computer in the network, which is just not possible. And I think more and more and more of this is going to continue to happen, is going to continue to become more popular. And so the sort of moral dilemmas that are created on the dark net drugs markets, i.e. more power, more ability to do things, 
more ability to do bad things, but more ability to think creatively about how you solve problems, I think this is just going to become more and more a sort of political preoccupation, a social preoccupation, because each of us, in my judgment, increasingly are just simply more powerful. It's more easy for us to do things, it's more easy for us to do good things and bad things. And so we need to have more responsibility about how we act when we're using digital technology. Who's going to help us do that? Because to me, I look at teachers and I think, oh my goodness, they don't have, and I understand why, but they don't know what's going on with any of these places because they never learned about this stuff when they went through teacher training. And suddenly they've got sort of one of the first generations in history that know where the students know more about the primary means of communication in society than the teachers do. That is a pretty big challenge. And indeed, a lot of this, a lot of this, is sort of growing pains of the digitalization of so much of life. But it is going to create, I think, if I could sum it up very simply, censorship is going to become more difficult. Monitoring and surveillance, I think, is going to become more difficult. Internet privacy for ordinary people is going to become more important and easier to achieve. That is going to result in huge opportunities for everybody, for all of us. Huge opportunities for journalists, huge opportunities for civil rights activists, huge opportunities for Democrats around the world, and huge opportunities for criminals. Huge opportunities for people who use stuff like this for drugs markets, for illegal pornography, for terrorist propaganda, whatever. But that, I think, is the world that we are approaching. A more turbulent one, a more difficult one. But I think in the end, I hope, I hope a better one. Because I hope that when we see the sort of freedom that we have, we will make good use of it. But it is not going to be without very, very heavy turbulence. And I think with that, I will stop. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Um, to understand, um, but by the way, let, let's start first with moral dilemmas. It's so funny that, for instance, there is a chapter about pro-anorexia sites where, where there are girls who tell each other before you eat, uh, drink uh, vinegar and think of decaying rats and everything. Um, you, you thought that that was the most disturbing chapter. Then you, the last phrase of that chapter is, I thought that all these digital friends were really going to help me. And in fact, they didn't, because once you get there on one of those sites, you feel that you have new family and everybody's really nice to you and they really listen to you. At the end of the book, your conclusion is the, is the opposite. You say, oh, well, it's innovative and, this is, and, and these people do to each other what the healthcare system doesn't do. So I, I thought that in 2014, you're not really... You're struggling with yourself, maybe. What's, what's, what's I'm, your I'm conclusion now? I'm, I'm still struggling. Ah, I'm, I'm, I'm still struggling that. greatly with it. Um, and I don't think I get any closer to the truth the more I talk about it, to be honest. But what I was trying to understand with these, there's a huge community of pro-anorexia sites. It's people that essentially encourage, as a lifestyle choice, anorexia. And anorexia is an incredibly serious illness. It's a mental and a physical illness. And it has the highest levels of mortality of any mental health condition. Um, and I'd heard about these sites that encourage that type of behavior. And I, like a lot of other people, had assumed that they were just very, very nasty places where people would be tricked into behaving in certain ways or mendacious people would be sort of conniving, manipulating, to, yeah, manipulating young w women to lose weight. But it was, it was almost the opposite of that. It was very friendly and welcoming, supportive community. If you go there when you're feeling low, you have friends that will listen to you, talk to you. You couldn't get a GP's appointment. You couldn't get a, an appointment with the doctor, but you can go online immediately and find hundreds of people that will talk to you and you know, create this sort of social glue. And that was the problem, because contained within that kind of friendly atmosphere was all this really destructive behavior. And I thought, that's a much, it's a much more serious problem because people, the, the girls that end up in there, they don't want to leave. 
because they feel like they found a community. I remember one of them lost her Twitter account for, for two days. I don't know for which reason, te technical reasons. And she, she said, according to your book, <laughs> that she had lost herself. That's strange. That means that these things say a lot about our identities, who we really are. If, if, if I feel that I do not, do not exist any longer because my Twitter account doesn't function, that's scary. It is, well, I mean, if, if someone took my Twitter account down tomorrow, I would be devastated. It has become part of our identity. And for these, for these young women, they have felt that they had found a community of like-minded individuals. You suddenly, you feel like you're going through something difficult on your own, and suddenly there's a whole world of people out there scattered around the globe that are suffering in exactly the same way as you, that know what you're going through, and that is incredibly powerful. But this is why that quote at the end that you mentioned, I thought these people were my friends, um, but in the end they weren't helping, they weren't helping me at all. But the thing that I noticed was, unless the NHS or any other health organization can present something better, that is not going to change. They are always going to go to those places because that is a service. They, they've created a community for themselves that they think helps them. And unless we can do something better, they're going to keep going there. So I wasn't, I kind of guess, uh, you, you sort of say I could, sort of contradicted myself in the sense that I wasn't so worried. It wasn't that I wasn't worried. It was, I was just worried about slightly different things. I didn't blame the people that had got sucked into it as much. I sort of, I, I worried about how they'd, they'd got there without realizing it, almost by accident. And that was a different sort of challenge. They weren't monsters. They were very misguided how they'd ended up there. And more scary is, again, a game with identities. You have people on, it's getting nastier now, I'm sorry. Um, suicide websites who make pacts I didn't know that existed, but you have suicide pacts where one depressed person tells another one, let's do it together. And one of the persons was sort of a troll because mm. it was not a young girl in distress. It was a man who was just saying this to people and, and, yeah. and, and manipulating them into... Yeah. Uh, yeah. What, it, I mean, you, you talk about teachers. What should teachers and parents do to prevent this from happening? Well, so the suicide sites were, again, I think quite misunderstood because most of it is people who are going to try to find like-minded individuals who they can talk to. They don't want psychiatric help or they don't want to see a psychologist. They, want they to often be want to talk and they want to be understood. And there are an awful lot of people that I spoke to that said they went to these sites where they could speak openly without being judged and it saved their lives. It meant they felt they had someone that understood them, that they could go even down to simple things like I didn't think I could make it through the night, but I posted some messages and I was looking forward to the response. So I went to bed knowing I wanted to wake up the next morning and that just got me through that dark phase. And there are people that go onto these sites, have been going onto these sites for years and years and years. So they are also much misunderstood, but there are occasions when people have gone in there to manipulate others. And that story that you said, it was dreadful, but pacts are common on, I say common, but I mean, it happens that two people agree to commit suicide at the same time, uh, sometimes in the same way, and people feel better to think they're doing it with somebody else. And occasionally, people just lie and convince others to do it, and they don't do it. They don't go through with it themselves. I mean, and it is awful. And this, this is a case actually that's been going through. Up, I think it's going all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. It's been to the state Supreme Court already. So, what do you do about that? I, the reason I wrote this book was simply to get people to know that stuff existed. So, God forbid you find yourself in one of those places and someone is talking to you about doing a pact, think, ah, oh, you know, I remember that terrible story. How do I know that this community is really here to help me? How do I know that I can trust that you are who you say you are? And so I hoped, I had this horrible moral dilemma throughout about whether I should write about suicide sites or whether I should write about the Silk Road or whether I should write, because that might draw people to those places. 
But in the end, I thought I'd rather people knew about this and actually understood how it worked, rather than turning up there without any knowledge of the dangers involved. To understand what, what's happening there, we need to understand about the psychology of um, multiple identities, and you describe that so well. That's, that's really brilliant. So, one of the things you mention is um, a psych psychological process which you call dissociation. So it means that a person can do real harm on the internet that he would never do in real life mm. because they feel that they're... Explain yeah. it, because well, it's, no, you're, it's you're, complex. You're exactly it. I mean, it's dissociating yourself from the actions that your online self is doing. And it's part of a sort of broader set of behavior which a, a cyber psychologist, this is a bit of a new discipline, cyber psychology, but I think it's really important, called John Sula in the late 90s and early 2000s came up with looking at bulletin boards and Usenet groups, so like you know, things don't change, um, which he called the online disinhibition effect. Essentially, just the way that the internet works and the fact that you're behind a screen, you're distant from the person you're speaking to, you can respond immediately, but without any comeback from them, you don't need to look at someone in the face, you don't see the consequences of your actions. All of those things wrapped together, for him, he said, results in people doing things online that they wouldn't do offline. And on the dark net, this is even stronger because nobody can find you, you can't get caught. So it makes the inhibitions even completely disappear. Well, it does, yes, yes and no, because I think that for a lot of people, that disinhibition effect is not so much knowing consciously that I have an anonymous browser and I'm using an encrypted messaging thing. It's more a sort of a general, I mean, because I'm sure many of you have seen the sort of bile that you get on normal internet sites, on popular social media platforms, it's just as bad as anything you'd find on a darknet site. It can be really, really nasty. And I think that disinhibition effect is not about having an amazing piece of technology. I think it's a bit bigger than that, broader than that. It's simply being behind the computer and not having to look at the people that you are attacking mm. or communicating. Th there is one example that you give yourself, which is um, maybe where you do have this, this situation, which is the child pornography, where, because you're three clicks away, as you write, from doing something really criminal. And, and so there, because y you go to this encrypted world, um, <coughs> you do take that step. Yeah. And then you have interviewed one man who says, I'm just a normal straight guy, no pedophilia, whatever. But I was slowly seduced into going there. Um, so there you, you do see that, or at least what he says is because it was possible, I went there and he would never done it in real life. Yes, and I mean, to be, to be clear, I didn't go to any of these sites myself, um, but I, I interviewed people that had been convicted of, of, of being in possession of illegal pornography um, or child abuse images, as it's usually called. Um, and there's a great misunderstanding about how, for, a, for the majority of people that are convicted of this, how it actually happens. And this man's story was the same as most of them. And it is, it's a kind of slow, gradual process by which you start with legal watching legal pornography but typically of older teenagers um, which is a bit of a problem because the most popular category for legal pornography certainly um, in the UK is is uh, youth yeah, that's it's just youth. like fashion I mean, magazines. Yeah, yeah, I mean, exactly. It's like Ruby Wex who said when the models become younger than this, they will throw embryos on the catwalk. Right, yeah. I mean, it's like, there, but, but, but there's, there is an obsession with youth in society and in pornography. Youth is the most popular category. Um, and a lot of people, they start there. And what happens is because of the way pornography has a lot of pop up images that come up and different options, and they call it a pornado, like a a tornado of pop-ups. Um, some of these so people... So innovative. Well, but, but the sex industry, has, I mean, the legal sex industry has always been a very innovative place on the internet. Um, 
But what happens is that the, the, uh, the, these men, and it is 99% men, sort of keep clicking and lowering in a, sort of lowering their inhibitions each time. And over the course of months, what happens is that they go sort of through younger and younger and younger age categories, often over the course of months or years. And they end up viewing sort of easily illegal stuff, sort of 12, 13, 11, 10-year-olds. And they argue and they say that they sort of almost got there without realizing it and sort of searching for the next taboo, one after the other. And now the difficulty there is to know the extent to which they are just trying to justify it to themselves, or certainly to me as the journalist trying to understand it. But I happen to believe this one guy in particular when he said, had it not been so easily available, I wouldn't have downloaded it. Okay. But it doesn't, he's still, it's still his fault. He is still entirely responsible for it, but I do believe that had it, not been, had it not been so easy to find, he probably never would have looked at it, and then he never would have got kind of sucked in. And again, that is not to try to apologize for what he did, but it's to try, try to understand the dynamic hmm. that takes place So here. that's a consumer. Now let's go have a look at the, the top of the pyramid. Is more child pornography being produced because... There are farm because this, this has grown yes. tremendously. There were eight, you, you write that there were 800 people reading some child pornography magazine in America by the end of the 80s, and now there are people that have a million images. Yes, so you had this situation that in, in, the, in the late 80s, the US, the FBI basically said, we have cracked the problem of child pornography. We don't, we, we, there's, we've managed to sort of clamp down sufficiently on the supply of it that we think we have it under control. And that was just before the internet really took off and changed it all completely. And in the UK, um, paedophiles from the UK would actually have to travel to, to the Netherlands right here to get it and then to try and import it back into the UK. And so the fact is that it was very hard to get. And there were circulations in the hundreds of these magazines. Um, Now, the problem with digital files is they're just infinitely replicable. You can copy them, share them, and what happens with the, with the Tor network here, because it's hard to censor, illegal sites get taken down, but people have downloaded all of the images onto their computer hard drives already, and then the next day they just re-upload them again to a, new, to a new site. And so you sort of distributed and decentralized the supply of this material, making it so difficult to ever completely stop it. But you know there's another really big challenge with all of this, which is that young people themselves are making more of the material themselves without realizing it because they are making videos of themselves at 14 or 15 or pictures and sharing it to, amongst their friends or posting it. And there are people that are trawling the net trying to find this and then downloading it and creating files and folders and then uploading all of that to sites for paedophiles to go so to. So is there not more child abuse as, as we know? We had the, the Robert M. case in Amsterdam. I don't know if you've heard of it. A couple of years ago, there was, there was a guy in, in working in kindergarten. Um, he came, I think, from Lithuania, and, and, and he abused a great number of children. Um, and I linked that immediately to... There's certainly this, more, this growing market. There's certainly more material available uh, online. The total number of abuse cases, I don't think, has increased in any way by the same. I mean, by in by any means in the same sort of scale. Okay. Um, That's really and, and the and the and the overwhelming majority of uh, sex offences are by members of the victim's family. So for all the sort of fear that you have about pre online predators and stuff, it, the most dangerous place is still family members. It's still so, home. So, yeah, of so, course. Nice so, to know just the days before you know, Christmas. So, but it, but, it's, but it's, it's, similar, it's, similar to, it's similar to the pro-anorexia. That, that the total number of young people with eating disorders has not actually increased. So for all the stuff I was saying about the pro-anorexia pro sites and communities, the total number has actually stayed pretty constant, but the way that it's expressed and the way that it's experienced has changed. What about, oh, let's, another very nice subject, um, Islamic State, are right. they, 
Is <laughs> the dark net very popular with them? Well, yeah, it's hard subjects, aren't they? Yeah. Um, so <laughs> you started it. Yeah, I did. Yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah. So for Islamic State, they have obviously a lot of their work is for propaganda purposes. They want to share their material very widely, and for that, the dark net is no good. The Tor hidden services, they don't have a big enough audience. It wouldn't reach people. <laughs> so they're on Twitter and YouTube and Facebook, and they're, they're constantly going to the well-known platforms to get their stuff out. But they will use, and I have seen a lot of evidence of them constantly monitoring the latest in encrypted software. How do we use? They, they send um, instructions around to their users saying, "How do we download the Tor browser to make sure we can't be located? Which messaging app?" They have an amazing grid, which is very useful for a journalist, of what are the most secure messaging apps and what are the least secure messaging apps, and it's pretty damn accurate. So they are constantly, of course, looking for ways to evade detection, and they always have, and they always will. And it's the same for most extremist groups. They're motivated. They want to use modern technology, and they will use it. And they will look out for. It. And of course, the amazing thing is that a lot of people are kind of surprised that people involved in Islamic State seem to be good at technology. I mean, they're men in their early 20s. Of course, they're good. I mean, they've grown up with this stuff. This isn't strange to them to use Twitter to post stuff and use hashtags to try to extend. <laughs> it's completely normal, bless you. It's completely normal for them. Uh, so it's important to look at the different ways that they, that they use it. They won't use this stuff for, for propaganda, but they will use it to try to stay hidden, and they're always trying to do both. Okay, so we should not be too dramatic about the dark net. On the other hand... Oh, well, if... the French government has talked about banning the use of Tor. Did anyone see that today? No. They have said, or that a proposal, I don't know how realistic it is, but a proposal... That was just somebody proving that he knew that it exists. <laughs> Could have been. But sort of a proposal to, 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 to prevent people in France using the Tor browser. And it's perfectly legal to use it. I use the Tor browser all the time. It's perfectly legal. It was funded by the U.S. State Department for years because of the benefits it has for free expression around the world. But I think they have recognized that it's causing them some problems. And as the kind of the default option when you are in the security services is stop people from using it because it's difficult for us. And I think that's a mistake. And then very quickly, when you look at all these transactions that use Bitcoin, it means that there could be if this all keeps growing, as you say, and you wrote something about Ethereum, yeah. that sounds like it's, there are new devices, new possibilities, so it will probably grow. If you have a sort of parallel economy at some point, it means that you have a lot of transactions. Um, people will never pay taxes. So it means that the state, and this sounds very nice and hip, and, but it means that the state will get less income and we do need the state to, to because we need schools we need hospitals uh, it's nice if you have um, some regulation in the traffic etc yeah um, you find that very bourgeois I, I, and, no um, I find that a very in it, we're now like stepping back and looking at the big picture on this because I think there is an interesting political alliance going on and it's one of the strangest ones of modern times because you have sort of Julian Assange and People that are sort of loosely inspired by libertarian thinking, making a common cause and alliance with social democrat left wingers who are in favor of big state, lots of collectivism. And yet they come together on the issue of internet privacy. Um, but in so many other parts of what they'd want of a system of government, they are completely different in every possible way. I think Edward Snowden, of course, who is a sort of hero of the left, was giving finance money to Ron Paul, who's a hero of the libertarian right. Now, interestingly, when you look back at the history of some of the crypto anarchy stuff, the Bitcoin stuff, a lot of the, what at the time in the early 90s was called the cypherpunk movement, people who were looking to use digital technology to evade state surveillance, they were very clear about why they wanted to do this. 
They wanted to do this because they wanted to denude the government of power. They didn't want government to control central banks or money supply. They didn't want government to be able to monitor us, and they hoped that that would lead us to some kind of libertarian utopia. And that is maybe that is where some of this is going. And I don't always know that we've thought that through fully about what it might mean for some of the collective projects we have. But certainly, at the very least, the issue of internet privacy has become such an important one for so many people for very good reason. Because all of our lives are on there. I mean, the reason it wasn't a big issue five years ago is because we weren't putting our lives online, but we are now. And so our privacy and control over that is hugely important. But somewhere inside that are the seeds of a, of a quite radical libertarian worldview. And I can, you know, and maybe that is a more dominant ideology of the future. Maybe it is the ideology of the networked age. And maybe more people do have sympathy with that idea now, with that set of ideas now. But it might be leading us somewhere that we're not fully, that we haven't fully thought through yeah, yet. Because the idea of civilization is that you protect vulnerability, isn't it? That you protect vulnerability. A civilized country would protect the most vulnerable, vulnerable people. And and if you have this illimited freedom, it means the freedom of the free fox and the free hen house. We're getting into big, f I mean, <laughs> possibly, but you know, a libertarian would say, no, it's down to me to make sure I look after the vulnerable and we free human beings will look after the vulnerable. We don't need a government telling us how to do it. So maybe, maybe not, but I think certainly like, when you look back at the history of the crypto anarchy and the, it's a very, very interesting one. And, it, and, and like I said, I, it might not lead us to where we think, but there's, there's, there's huge benefits to come from it too. Okay. And that's, I think, the debate that the Bali will also start. Mm -hmm. um, let's just go on, on the deep web or the dark net with Stan, our ethical hacker. Mm -hmm. I'll there. So I go back there. I'm going to go back there first. Yeah. So, with a hacker, you might expect something like this. Mm -hmm. Someone wearing a hoodie. Um, but there are actually also hackers that wear a fancy suit, like me. How did I end up there? I actually started hacking at the age of 10. Um, I really sucked at playing computer games. And there was only one way for me to win a computer game. And it was to hack into my friend's computers. That's where it all started. And I really found out that I, I just loved this, this solving this puzzle, cracking the codes, breaking into systems. And of course, the challenge of breaking into your friends' computers, is, it, it disappears quite soon. So you start looking for more challengeable environments. Um, luckily, I found out that I could turn my hobby into my profession. So that means that nowadays, I can hack into systems on a legal basis. So to give a few examples of how cool my job is, I really love it. I've hacked into, on a legal basis, um, payment systems of really large banks that process billions and billions of euros. I've hacked into the criminal records of Willem Holleder, hacked into um, um, designs of weapon systems of the Joint Strike Fighter. It's really cool. And it's also really good that we do this stuff. Because you want to know if your system, if technology is resilient against hacker attacks. Because the other part of my job is if a malicious hacker, a evil hacker, was there first instead of me, then I'm there to do incident response and clean up the mess. And it also happens a lot. So in the next 10 to 15 minutes, I will take you into my world. It will be only the, the tip of the iceberg in this limited time that I have. And this world, the, the dark corners of the internet around cybercrime and hacking, um, it's a subject that Jamie has not written about very much in his book. And we discussed this during dinner this evening, why, and one of the reasons was that Jamie was maybe a little bit afraid that when writing about this topic that he would also attract <laughs> these kind of people. Um, 
But I can show you some interesting things about this world in the next 10 to 15 minutes. Where will we go? Any suggestions? Where to start? Government, yeah. Um, most people, most people that ask this question, they say, "Yeah, we go on a tour network and find some some really really malicious stuff there." But the truth is, there is there is probably much more available on what I call the clear net, clear net, the normal internet, the regular internet where you and I go to uh, to Amazon, to Google, uh, to Markplatz, whatever. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Questions around DigiD here, our digital authentication system of the government. Um, indeed, also health insurance providers now also connecting to the system. A system that's based on a username and password that when it is once stolen, it can easily be sold on the black markets. So let's go and find some of these black markets. And as I said, often when I touch upon this topic, many people will think that I go immediately on this store network with, with hidden services and, and, and anonymity. But fact is, you can better go to Russia, in most cases. For example, this is a pretty well-known Russian forum. And what do they sell here? They sell hacked computers. For example, a thousand hacked computers in the Netherlands will cost you 250 US dollars. Not per computer, but per thousand. Okay. Um, looking at how cheap this is, this, this also shows how, how how massive this thing is, on what scale this happens. Um, but if you go to Belarus, with Russland, then all of a sudden prices drop to as low as $50 per thousand computers. Why? Why is this so cheap? Why is this more cheap than computers in the Netherlands? Sorry? No, no, it's, it's more that there's, there's less to gain from computers in Belarus than computers in the Netherlands. Because we use internet banking more often, uh, we, we appear to be a bit richer um, than, uh, than the average person from Belarus. So, this kind of website, it already shows you that if you want to be in the world of digital crime, if that's where you want to act, if you want to be a hacker, a cyber criminal, you don't need to be that technical. Any of you can be a cyber criminal and make good money of this. And you might say, okay, but well, with this website, I only buy a hacked computer. And then what? What should I do with that hacked computer? Well, let's make things more easier and let's move, let's move up, the, uh, up the food chain. Um, so for example, these are some well-known forums, again, in Russia that discuss things like, well, anonymi anonymity and security. That's what today is about as well. Payment systems, banks, casinos, credit cards. Okay. And one of the highly regarded web shops that is being discussed in this underground is a web shop called FE Shop. So, let's go to that web shop. It's right here. This is a web shop that is currently selling Credit card data of almost a million persons. Yeah, that's, that's quite a lot, but this is definitely not the only web shop. It has many competitors in this area. There, there are dozens and dozens of web shops like this. This also shows you how large this economy is. Does this web shop also sell credit card data from people in the Netherlands? Oh yes, definitely. Um, for example, if you're called Fleur or Serpil, and this is your zip code, and you know that your credit card will expire in October 2016, then please come to me after this, uh, this short presentation, because your credit card data are for sale. So what do you get if you buy this? You actually buy the data that someone who was doing an online purchase, the data that he or she entered on his or her infected computer. 
So data like credit card number, expiration date, um, CCV security code, that's the security code on the back of your credit card, uh, but also address information. Everything that you enter when you buy something online at Zalando or Bold.com or whatever is being stored, is being forwarded to the hacker, and is being sold on a massive scale on websites like this for the whopping price of only $12. Why is it this cheap? Well, there's basically two business models behind this. One business model is to start abusing this credit card information. But that's also pretty risky, because what do you need to do? You need to go and buy something online with this credit card information. Um, you need to buy that in a means that you're not traceable, so you're probably going to use this Tor thing that we will touch upon later. Um, you will need to provide a shipping address where the goods can be sent to um, that will not be directly linked to you, like, for example, an um, a empty office building or something like that. And then you will need to start selling the goods on eBay or Marktplatz or Craigslist or wherever. So that's pretty risky because you're, 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 well, the chances of being, being traceable and being caught are quite high. And that's a completely different business model, because you can make a low investment and take the risk, or you can say, well, I leave the risk to others, and I will start just selling this data. A million credit cards at $12 a piece, or $8 a piece, or whatever. Let's say that if only 10% of this data is being sold, then you make huge amounts of money. And the funny thing is that it also shows you insight into the, to this business model. Because I showed you, I told you that this website is all about volume, selling large volumes of data. And it even has rules. Let's see here, it's in Russian and for us also in English. It said there is this thing like, if it's no good, then you get your money back. So if you make, this, make a purchase here and it turns out that this credit card data is invalid, then you can return it within 20 minutes and get new credit card data. Why? Because these guys are commercial. This is a business model. They're trying to sell goods. And they are, are really good commercial guys. They are really, really good at doing business. The only thing is that it is an illegitimate business. But the business model behind this is no different than other business models that we see. Just like Jamie showed us that the business model of websites like Black Market Reloaded and the Silk Road and all those hidden services on the Tor network, they are not much different from the business model of eBay. Um, I could go on and on about this for, for hours, probably. I could show you things like this, like DDoS attacks. So services to, um, to make websites offline. Um, really nice advertisements like this, raw layer features where it says that it can, can take down any website. I think that it even says, take down highly protected networks. Um, for example, you've heard recently that a internet provider like, uh, like Ziggo was taken down. Well, what, what, what will that cost you? Probably that, not that much. Um, two hours of a pretty large DDoS will cost you $250. That's the VIP package. Um, I can go on and on about this for hours, but what I want to show you is that this world is, 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 is big. It's on a massive scale, and, and, and this is the downside of what technology has brought us. It brings us good things, but it also enables a world like this. I spent hours and hours a week in this world to be able to inform my customers on what threats are upcoming and well, what, to, what they need to defend against. Then, okay, it's really nice that if you're from Russia, that you can spend your time in this online world um, quite untouchable. But for us, for many Western Europeans, um, it wouldn't be that wise to just, from your regular home internet connection, go on such a website and start entering this community. If you would do that, well, you need a, a tool like Tor. So who of you have spent time on the Tor network? Okay, that's still a minority. Then I will give a really quick introduction to what Tor is. Um, this is a, a explanation of bits of freedom. So normally you would be at home, and you would go to a website, and there would be a connection from your home internet connection to this website somewhere else on the world. And 
That connection is being routed to different places on Earth, different systems, different routers, different internet service providers. But anyone in that route, from your computer to this server that you're visiting, can see where the connection originates from and where the connection is going to. So if you're going to an um, illegal website, anyone in that in that route could see that, any internet service provider, government, or whoever. If you go to a, a forum that is known um, to be against an oppressive regime, the oppressive regime could easily spot that if they start looking into the internet traffic. So Tor is a solution for this. It is a network of computers called nodes, and these nodes allow you to set up an encrypted route from your computer to this website that you're visiting. So you have entry nodes called guard nodes, you have relay nodes, they can be all over the world, and eventually you have an exit node which is the connection to the website you're visiting. And each link in this route is, is like, like a separate connection, it's like a layer within an onion, that's why it's called the onion router. So for each node, in this network only knows the node before him and the node after him. So if someone would be observing the internet at this particular node, that observer would only see the Tor node before and the Tor node after that connection. It would not see the initial point where the connection comes from and the website that the connection is going to. That it really, really in a nutshell and really short summary is what a Tor network is. And basically it provides you a way to browse the internet anonymously, and to host websites on the internet that are really hard to censor. So this is Tor, and Tor is only part of the solution of staying, uh, staying anonymous online. Um, there's more to that, actually. Um, don't have time to, uh, to, to, to address all the details, but there are systems like Tails, which is a freely downloadable operating system that have all kinds of privacy enhancing technologies, including Tor, built in. And this is really, really a good thing. Because if you're behind the Great Firewall of China, as we call it, or if you are um, a, 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 um, in an opposite group in Syria, for example, then you need this technology to express your thoughts. Um, and this is being promoted, for example, by uh, civil rights groups like Bits of Freedom, which is a good thing. But definitely, this also has a downside. Uh, Islamic State has already been mentioned. Well, this is a, um, a manual from an um, a Islamic State supporting uh, forum on the internet. And this is, in Arab, a guide to how to use this TILS operating system. It's a step-by-step -step guide, as you can see on how to use TILS and TOR in order to remain anonymously online. Okay, that's some basics behind TOR. Then what is there to, to find? Um, well, you just download this TOR web browser, as Jamie already explained, and now you can go to these hidden services, these, these websites that are really hard to censor. And they, all, they don't have regular domain names like uh, ebay.com or whatever. They have these .onion addresses. And, for example, this one is zqkt blah 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 .onion. You just have to need to know this address. But the address of this particular website is pretty easy to find even on the regular internet. Because this is like the start page, startpagina.nl. For, for most of you who first go to the, to the Tor network. It's the hidden wiki. It's like an introduction to the Tor network. And probably the guys and girls here that raised their hands when I asked them whether they went, ever went to the Tor network, they have been here, the hidden wiki. It's the starting point for, for, for most of the first time Tor users. So what's here? Well, there's all kinds of things like uh, financial services. Um, wait, I can buy Hacked credit cards here? Well, we've already seen that in Russia, so that's not a, really a new thing. Um, but, okay, also passports, arms, uh, contract killers, blah, 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 it says. Okay, so let's go to some of these websites. Cheap euros, who wouldn't want that? Counterfeit euro money, 
Well, on the picture, it looks quite good. A fake passport. Cool. Guns. But the question is, if you would, pay, if you would buy any of this, like the euros, the fake passports, or, or even the guns, why on earth, after I make an anonymous purchase at an anonymous website, and a, I pay with a, a Bitcoin, with a with a digital currency that's really hard to trace, then why would the seller, in this case, deliver? Probably he won't. For most of the advertisements like this on the Tor network, and especially the hidden wiki, those are scams. These are just fraudsters putting up websites like these, tricking first-time Tor users into falling for this kind of scams and just, just buying something for 600 euros on this with, 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 with Bitcoin, with digital currency. Because um, you have no clue whether this seller is reliable. So the technology alone doesn't really promote a, a reliable criminal ecosystem. For that, you need, what Jamie explained, marketplaces. Um, there have been a few. Silk Road is probably one of the most famous ones. Um, I wasn't that much interested into Silk Road because it was mostly around drugs. Uh, Black Market Reloaded was what was more interesting to me. There was also fake passports, uh, uh, weapons, uh, hacking services, etc. there. Um, but these marketplaces, they, they are taken down from time to time. So Silk Road, Black Market, Black Market Reloaded, they used to exist a few years ago. They aren't there now anymore. Um, but the principle of markets, that will remain there forever. So for example, now one of the more popular markets is a thing like this. This is the outlaw market. Um, it sells, in this case, drugs. There's a lot of drugs. Um, for example, ecstasy, well, not really that special in, uh, in Amsterdam. Um, but what is special is, again, a thing that Jamie also outlined. It's the whole thing, the, the whole ecosystem, the whole system of, of reviews. So, for example, this seller, he's from Germany, has made more than 50 sales, um, currently has 45 offers, Mostly around ecstasy, I see. Yeah. And many positive reviews here. Um, but as a first time user, how do you get here? How do I get these bitcoins? Well, really low technology. Uh, if you have ideal. You can acquire your Bitcoins on a website like this. You can use um, Bitcoin Fox, like the mixing services that Jamie already explained, to, to, to get your Bitcoins anonymously from your account to a marketplace like this. Well, I can go on for hours and hours and hours. This was a 15 minutes introduction into these dark corners of the internet. Um, again, there's a lot of media hype around the Tor network. Much of the illicit things going on on the internet is out there on the regular internet. I call it the clear net. Um, there's a Tor network which allows um, you and me, people living in oppressed regimes, a really good way to get online in an anonymous way. Um, but it also has a downside. It also enables the world that I've shown you in the last 15 minutes. I'm not going to be a judge here. I just wanted to show you, to get you thinking about this topic. Um, give it a thought. Um, discuss this with each other. And um, I hope that you enjoyed the insights that I provided in the last 15 minutes. Thank you. Okay, it's your time. Whoever wants to ask a question to any of the gentlemen, please go ahead. <laughs> Is there anyone? If you have a question, please raise your hand. Yes. 
Gentleman in the middle. And then we wait for the mic and we say who we are and then we're brief. <laughs> you stay Excuse anonymous. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Could you stand up, please? I'll hold the mic. Okay. Uh, my name is Shamil. I wanted to ask, the tour is uh, quite slow. When is it going to be quicker? Because <laughs> now, <laughs> nights and nights, I'm standing one one uh, market. Uh, but when is it going to be quicker in in the future? There's alternatives to Tor, like I2P, for example. But if you want a quick <laughs> anonymous connection, go to a VPN service in Russia. Okay. Um, a Tor is run by, by a network of volunteers, and so it has very little money. And so they're always trying to fundraise so they can build more or get more exit nodes so they can handle more traffic more quickly. Like that's one of their big challenges and they're always trying to do it. And so I think for a lot of people they use Tor for very specific things and normal web browsers for other things. Uh, because there's no point really using it if you're just going onto, you know, CNN.com and you just want to quickly <laughs> see something. Um, well, that again depends on where you are in the world, of course. Uh, yeah. So, you, you, so I, I can see it remaining quite slow for quite some time, but I think that a lot of people, I believe more and more people will start investing, donating money to it, and they'll try and get the network speed quicker. I think there was another question in the back. Yeah, anyone? I'll come up. Sorry. Could you stand up, please? Hi. I'm Joshua van der Beek. Uh, just a question. Imagine that as a government you would want perhaps to regulate this. First, I thought that's impossible, but then, if I understand it correctly, you, you, there will always be a link between, let's say, the computer <coughs> of the person using it, going to the first chain, or how do you call it, so is my understanding correct that you can only regulate it in the way that apparently the French government is now suggesting to completely ban it, but there are no other options? Or how do you imagine that you want to regulate it? How, what would the options be? Regulating is, is, is probably really difficult because this is... It's the, the, the Tor network is just an implementation of a principle, and there would be many more implementations of this principle that you could think of. So, so regulating the principle is pretty difficult. Um, monitoring it, however, is possible. Because the Tor network, it's, it's, a bit, it's, it's, it's a bit technical, but it only allows for anonymous communications. But one of the tricks that, for example, intelligence agencies have pulled is to hack into a website and try to identify some aspects of the computer. So not look at the connection, but look at your computer. For example, what resolution of the screen you could, does your computer have? What kind of fonts do you have installed on, uh, on your computer? Um, and so there's many, many technical tricks. And it's like, like a rat race between the, the developers at the Tor project versus intelligence agencies um, trying, to, uh, trying to monitor the, the traffic that's on this store network. It really is a te technological rat race going on between improving the privacy enhancing technologies versus being able to monitor this kind of technologies. I mean, I... Sure. One second. What would you then say about this French uh, suggestion? Do you think that's going to work or what's your option about it? Yeah, look at the Great Firewall of China. This is not a new thing. China has been doing this for years and years, trying to block uh, um, tour traffic. And, and, and well, there's a lot of effort put into this in China. So if France wants to do this, then they should learn from China, probably. Um, it's but a China, thing to say, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The situation in China has shown that it is almost impossible to block the tour network and this principle. Um, I have I've hacker friends in China for who this really easy to get onto to, into the Tor network if you just know what to do. Jamie, is there anything yeah. you would like to add? Well, um, of course, one of the things that the intelligence agency uh, do is to set up exit nodes and um, entry nodes and then try to monitor the traffic as best they can to get a feel for what's going on. So 
I mean, I think you're right that the answer here is not in trying to ban it, not in trying to stop it, which I think would be incredibly difficult and expensive. And look at the company you'd be keeping if you're the French government. But it's to get better at working out ways of legally monitoring it, or working out better ways of trying to do targeted attacks on particular suspects. Um, because I think that the, it's not that any of these systems are absolutely foolproof, they'll never fail. I think it's that it just makes it more difficult and time-consuming per person that you are trying to monitor. And so inevitably you monitor fewer people. Um, but it means you have to get much better at targeting the people that you are trying to monitor. And I think that is going to be the direction that the intelligence agencies are going to go. Far more sort of careful digital investigations, far more targeted attacks on individual devices, and I think less of this sort of mass monitoring or banning of apps. In spite of what the rhetoric and the language often is, I think that's the direction we'll inevitably have to go. We have a next question over here. Uh, yes, what, what are your thoughts on uh, the hacking group Anonymous? Um, are they good or bad? And do you think that they have in the past or will in the future act as uh, invisible moral arbiters of the world? Ah. Huh. Hmm. That's hmm. interesting. Do you want to start with that? First, well, Jamie. Then I get to my yeah, computer. Yeah, they started, they actually feature at the very beginning of my book because the book opens on 4chan, which is a, a, an open, clear net site which is a very sort of troll site, hacking site. It's very funny, uh, but also can be very nasty. And the name Anonymous came from the fact that people post under the name Anonymous on that site. It sort of grew out of that culture. Um, right, there's This fortune. is fortune. <laughs> How old were you the first time you put something in your ass for sexual purposes? Yeah. <laughs> this is where Anonymous started. Yeah, you and need so you, to realize that. So you can see that this is where the names come, anonymous, 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 anonymous. And I think they, in a, in a, in a funny way, they've sort of matured over the years as well. But it's partly just growing up. And they, I think that some of them do, the difficulty with anonymous, it's a difficulty with a lot of similar groups, is that no one's really in control. Anyone can kind of do whatever they want as a little collective, uh, and then call themselves anonymous and just yeah. go ahead and do it and then say it was anonymous doing this. And there's a sort of lot of groups that operate to that principle now. Just do it and take the name. And in many ways, Al-Qaeda and Islamic State had a similar sort of model. Just take the name and do something and use the sort of notoriety. So I tend to judge anonymous based on very specific actions that they take and decide whether I think one of them, in my judgment, is a good or a bad thing, rather than looking at the group as a whole. So yeah. after this the Paris a... attacks, when Anonymous were saying, okay, we're starting the war on Islamic State, and yeah. we'll oh, this is so nice, we have this moral police now, that is a bit naive to believe that? Well, they, they certainly have been able to do some good things, because they will just go ahead and do stuff that would take the authorities quite a long time to get legal authorization to do. So, like, let's try and break into Twitter accounts and yeah. hack into them and use them, and stuff that the authorities wouldn't do, but that might have a useful purpose. And at the same time, of course, they're removing accounts that are being monitored by the intelligence agencies who are like, please, can you leave those accounts alone? We're watching them. By the so way, this is sort of throws in a complicating factor into the mix. That's exactly what this group is doing. Um, are you so part this of is it? A, of this? No, I'm not. Yeah, no, no, you're not on anonymous? No, no, oh. I'm not. Um, but yeah, this but is you a... would say that, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> this is an operation that has, has uh, started out of anonymous. Uh, it's called Ghost Security, and they are quite famous for indeed taking down the propaganda websites, Twitter accounts. Um, they have this web page where you can um, can report a, a a Islamic State Twitter account or a Facebook account or a website, and they will try and take it down. They have been quite successful. They are some skilled hackers behind this. Um, that's the kind of initiatives that we uh, that we currently observe. Who are these people? I mean, is that their full-time job? Are they being paid by governments? Who are they? That's difficult to say, but, mm. but from what I know about them, this is a part-time uh, job. They do have some loose contacts with intelligence agencies, but, but just loose contacts. Okay. Yeah. But it's interesting that they sort of... 
the alliances have changed because they wouldn't they were usually quite anti western anti american anti western governments but then something like isis or islamic state turns up and a sort of an alliance against them can be formed between western governments i think they were also on. active um hacking uh, child pornography sites weren't they yes and they they have been <laughs> i mean the problem has been with with that is that they have they have identified servers where tor hidden service sites hosting illegal pornography have been and they've managed to then remove that and report it to the authorities but this the sum result was that more and more people heard about this went and visited those sites and within three days there were more sites up again so it's like a really <laughs> It's a very difficult problem to try to overcome this because each time you want to be seen to be removing this stuff and yet you know that it's going to pop up again maybe even larger. Okay, next question. The final question. We have time for one more. Yes. Yeah, this may sound like an adventure, but when I was an intelligence agency and I would find out the the secrets of the Tor system I wouldn't tell anyone. So if you think uh, uh, information can only track from one step to another, not the next one, maybe someone found it out and know how the information travels. Can you imagine that that really happened? Yes, and, and those kind of tricks, they, um, they probably do exist. But the funny thing is that Edward Snowden gave us some really good insights into how big the problem of the Tor network really is for a uh, intelligence agency like the NSA. And there are various documents disclosed by Edward Snowden that outline that the Tor network was a really big challenge for the NSA. Yeah, and um, there was that one slide that just said Tor sucks on it <laughs> that was uh, an internal... So, and of course you might say, well, Edward Snowden could have been a plant to make us think we know what's going on and we don't. And you can call it sort of, that's the, I mean, that's the, and I've heard people say that, mm -hmm. that, that, that he is a plant. This is getting a bit virtual. <laughs> but it often comes down to the way the software is designed. Tor is an open source piece of software that everybody can look at it and see how it functions and try to improve it. So the idea is that that's actually a more reliable system because everyone kicks the tires and sees if it holds. And so, yes, for a while, the FBI had an exploit in Tor, and I think they were using JavaScript to try to insert it so people were being traced, and someone spotted it because it's all open and said, we've got a problem here, and they fixed it. So there is this rat race that you mentioned, and the principle of those behind the Tor network is if we keep it open, we can have more trust in it. And that's a kind of, I guess, a debate in hacker circles about whether closed or open systems mm -hmm. tend to be more reliable. My final question to Jamie, because um, you're so much into this. Um, there's a paradox. After you finished writing the book, you gave yourself compulsory internet free time. Yes. Um, why and does it make you happier? Yeah, because I, when I was writing uh, the book, I was spending a lot of time, not just on the sites that you've just seen here, but yeah, it was neo-Nazi sites and it was it was pro-anorexia sites and it was, it's a depressing series of subjects and um, so basically what you've just had to go through but every night for like months and months um, and it was very and it was it was really I was sort of struggling to sleep and I was getting quite depressed and I think a, a lot of that was because in a lot of these virtual worlds, everything is sort of amplified. It's a more extreme version of reality. You have heroes and villains and amazing things and terrible things. And I was just struggling. I was sort of staying on there until the early mornings and then not being able to sleep because I was sort of so agitated by it and getting quite depressed and miserable. And that was also because I wasn't spending any time offline. I was spending all of my time in front of this tiny little screen and I was missing out with all my friends and all the rest of it. And so, yeah, following the internet, following the book being published, I set this rule that I wouldn't go on the internet after, it was meant to be nine, but I couldn't do it, after 10 o'clock at night. And uh, that's been amazing. Yeah, I mean, really, like, <laughs> honestly, make sure you shut down your devices 
for at least two or three hours before you go to bed. And have a beer with the mates. And have a beer with your mates. Exactly. Let's all do that. Let's all have a beer together. Um, there will be a book sale and you will be signing. Is that okay? So. Yeah. Can we ask yeah, you to yeah. Can we thank you so much for all that information? It was really uh, very fascinating. So uh, the bar is open, the book sale is open, and thank you both so much for such a very in interesting evening.